character, he would start with an envelope addressed to me, and he would send it to an address where I didn't live, and that it would be returned to his studio. He would then Xerox both sides of it, and send it to a second address where I didn't live either, and I'd be sent back to the studio again, photocopied, put inside a bigger envelope, sent to a third address, and so on. Each one of these 25 characters, and they were artists, dealers, friends of his, and so on, was, had a series of journeys to make. So, for instance, one, art, one um, dealer was sent to eight hotels in Morocco. Another, um, another was sent to 12 rivers in Italy. So they made these journeys and they would come back. And it's an interestingly playful work about the possibility of contact with other people, about the postal service, about journeys and so on. Um, at a slightly later point, or later in 1969 or 70, he began to work with stamps. And he got interested in making um, works that used the different permutations of colours or values of stamps. On the wall there you see a very small work with um, a stack of six envelopes. What he's doing there is taking three coloured stamps and working them out in all their permutations. So if you've got three colours, you need six envelopes to do all the permutations. That was the first in a series of work involving permutations of stamps. At one point, he made a work with four colours of stamps, that was 24 envelopes, then five colours, 120, six colours, and the largest work was done with seven different coloured stamps, and that's like 5,040 envelopes. And all these works relied on chance and relied on the postal service working. Because if one envelope wasn't returned, there would be a gap in the work. And it also became interesting to him how whenever he sent Afghanistan, Guatemala, France, Morocco, and <coughs> Afghanistan again. So wherever he would visit, and he traveled all across the world, he would always send back an image of, of Turin. And I think um, it's very playful, but there's also a political idea here about a determination not to make a tourist, or not to to send back a tourist exoticizing image of another culture, but to remind the recipient in Italy how Turin or how Milan represents itself. But of course we also see the stamps on the other side, which is an image chosen by the Ethiopians, for instance, to represent Ethiopia. Now I think you could spend hours in this room, as you could in all the rooms, especially with this wonderful poster work which we've got on loan from a museum in Munster, which shows how he would use drawings inside the postal, inside the envelopes, and pair the drawings with the envelopes. But for reasons of time, we're going to move on to the next work, the room, which looks at his biros. Materials, the blue biro. And they were made by, um, they were made by groups of students and people in Rome, organized by a, collabor a collaborator of Boetti. So what's interesting is um, that they're not hand-drawn by Boetti himself, but by other people. And just as the postman had something to do with the creation of the postal works, and just as the Afghan craftswomen would embroider the embroideries, so here students in Rome would fill out these sheets of Byron. Um, now, um, in a work like this of 12 panels, each panel is made by a different person. And it's extraordinary when you look at them, you get a sense of the different sort of sensibility of each person, how compact their lines were, how wavy it is across the surface. But we know nothing about who this person was. So, you know, often the mark, the drawn mark, is held to be some kind of clue to the personality of the artist. What Boetti does is to give us all these hand-drawn marks, um, but we know nothing about who the person who actually drew it was. In all of these biro works, you'll see commas, and the commas correspond or, or link back to the column of letters on the side, and phrases are spelled out, so that one spells out the name of the six senses. And this one over here, spells out a phrase that we've taken for the name of this room. And the phrase is metere al mondo il mondo. And it's, I think, one of Boetti's most important phrases and most enigmatic phrases. 
I would say it signifies a few things, but the most important thing is the idea that the artist should bring the world into the world, so bring what exists already into their work. So instead of an artist inventing from their imagination or coming up with something that no one's ever thought of before, the principle for Boetti is that the artist should use what's already out there in the world. And that means they should use a biro pen rather than, like Eve Klein did, inventing their own colour. Or they should use an image that's on the front page of a magazine. Or they should use information about rivers. Or they should use a numeric system. Or they should use the postal service. Or they should use an image of the world, like in the maps. And in all these different kind of works, um, there's this idea of meta al mondo in mondo, bringing what already exists in the world into the work. Um, the other translation of that phrase is giving birth to the world. That's the sort of idiomatic translation. And I think that's the, the point is really that when the artist brings what already exists in the world into their work, they give birth to a new world. They create the world anew. So in um, 1970, um, Boetti and his first wife, Anne-Marie Sozo, who was here a little while ago, but might be here still, I'm not sure, they embarked on a, a project together to come up with a list of the thousand longest rivers in the world. And for many years, they accumulated data from geographical agencies, from atlases, and from other publications about river lengths. Now, at the top, of the list, we've got the Nile and the Amazon, but later on down the list, we have curiously named rivers like the um, Koto and the Beaver and uh, the Judoma and so on. And um, the, the end result of this project was a brilliant book called Classifying the Thousand Longest Rivers in the World, and then two monumental embroideries, one which is now in Frankfurt and the other which is in New York. And you have this list of these thousand longest rivers. I think what they were interested in doing is, is playing with classification, but also in exploring the absurdity of classifying. Because what does it mean to classify a river? As soon as you come up with a list of rivers, you also come up with a series of questions about you know, what it means to measure water. And if you look out here, you can see that we could either measure at high tide or right now at low tide. Uh, and the, the measurement of the Thames, which sadly didn't make it into the top 1,000, um, will depend on the, uh, the tide. Also, do you measure down the middle of the river, or do you measure um, down one bank, which might have a, a wigglier side? Do you measure from the source to the mouth, or from the mouth to the source? Do you choose the direction of the river as it was named by an explorer? Um, or do you choose a direction of a river that as might be from the tributary that's furthest away from the source? And there's a text at the front of the book by Anne-Marie in which she poses all these questions. And the last line is that this present classification, like all preceding or following ones, will always be provisional and illusory. And I think it's this a beautiful idea to come up with a classification and to make the book and the embroideries, but also to know right from the outset that a classification is impossible and illusory. Now we're going to move on.